It is my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dr. Ziba Mir Husseini. Um, Dr. Hus Mir Husseini is a legal anthropologist specializing in Islamic law, gender, and development. She has a BA in sociology from Tehran University um, and a PhD in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge. She is prof professorial research associate at the Center for Middle Eastern and Islamic Law at the University of London. And she's held numerous research fellowships and visiting professorships. We're very glad that she's able to be with us tonight and speak. The fellowships include a Hauser Global Law Visiting Professorship at New York University. Um, and she has been a founding member of the Musawa Global Movement for Equality just and Justice in the Muslim Family, which she's going to talk to us about today. She's the author of many important publications. They include Marriage on Trial, a study of Islamic family law in Iran and Morocco, Islam and Gender, the religious debate in contemporary Iran, Islam and Democracy in Iran, and Control and Sexuality, the Revival of Zina Laws in Muslim Context, which was done in conjunction with women living under Muslim laws. Um, and she has also um, directed and participated in the production of two um, award-winning feature-length documentary films, which is how um, one of the major ways in which her work has circulated. Um, these are Divorce Iranian Style, which came out in 1998, and Runaway, which came out in 2001. So as you can see from just these brief comments that don't even do full justice to her biography, we're very fortunate that she's here tonight to share with her her work and then to discuss it with all of you. Dr. Z Mir Husseini. Thank you. Thank you for this kind uh, introduction, and it's really an honor to be here. I'm so excited to be at Barnard College, and in fact, this is my first time here, so it is really nice. I want to start with a video clip uh, of a gathering. Uh, it was hosted by Sisters of Islam, a Malaysian uh, women's group, which since its formation in 1988 has argued for Muslim women's rights and equality within an Islamic framework. Sisters is one of the few women's organizations that has no qualms in identifying as both Islamic and feminist. So I thought that it would be good to start with this video clip, and we just uh, will watch about two minutes of it. Musawa, which is Arabic for equality, was planned over the course of two years at workshops in Istanbul, Cairo, and London, and through constant electronic communication. The planning committee, whose membership was drawn from 11 countries, consulted a wide range of uh, Muslim activists and academies, uh, academics and produced the Musawa Framework uh, for Action, a program for bringing together Islamic and feminist um, approaches to argue for an egalitarian interpretation of Islam's sacred texts and for the reform of family laws in Muslim contexts. As a member of the planning committee, is my voice too? No. As a member of the planning committee, here I want to tell something of the story behind the formation of Musaba. It is the story of the emergence of new voices and scholarship in Islam that are feminist in their aspiration and demands and Islamic in their source of legitimacy. These voices, I shall argue, herald a new phase in the troubled relationship between Islam and feminism. One salient feature of this phase is that it has brought women, rather the abstract notion of gender equality to center stage. Another is that it has unmasked the global and local power relations and a structure within which Muslim women have to struggle for justice and equality. That their struggle for equality is as much theological as it is political and that it is hard and at times futile to ask when theology ends and politics begins. What initiated this phase was the confrontation in the last two decades of the 20th century between two powerful 
opposing movements, feminism and political Islam. In the new century, which opened with the rhetoric and politics of the war of terror, this confrontation took a new dimension. And it became clear that the real side of battle is between despotism and democracy on the one hand, and patriarchy and gender equality on the other. Let me begin with what I see um, uh, as a turning point uh, in the politics of religion and uh, gender, both globally and uh, locally. That is the year 1979, and two events in that year were important. The first was the success of uh, Iranian Revolution, which brought uh, an end to the US-backed monarchy and established an Islamic Republic. This marked a zenith in the revival of Islam as both a spiritual and a political force. In Iran and some Muslim countries, it led to the reversal of the process of secularization of laws and legal systems that had begun in the uh, early 20th century, and to the reintroduction of laws that confronted, uh, that conformed to traditionalist and pre-modern interpretations of the Sharia. So in fact, what we see at the beginning of the 20th century is the process of secularization of laws and legal systems. By 1979, after that, it starts to be reversed. The second event was the UN um, General Assembly's adoption of the CEDO, that is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which gave a clear international legal mandate to those who advocate equality between men and women and to the notion of women's rights as human rights. The decades that followed saw the concomitant expansion globally and locally of both feminism and political Islam. On the one hand, the human rights framework and instruments such as CEDO gave women's rights activists what they needed most, a point of reference and the language to resist and challenge patriarchy. In the 1980s, the international women's movement and women's NGOs expanded all over the world, including the Muslim countries. In fact, before 1990s, there were no such a thing as women's NGOs in the Muslim context. By the early 1990s, a transnational movement further coalesced around the idea that violence against women was a violation of their human rights and succeeded in inserting it into the agenda of the international human rights community. In their campaigns, women's rights activists made visible various forms of gender-based discrimination and violence rooted in cultural traditions and religious practices. Protection from such violence became a core demand. In Muslim context, on the other hand, Islamic forces, Islamist forces, whether in power or in opposition, started to invoke Islam and Sharia as a legitimizing device to reverse the process of reform and secularization of legal systems. Tapping into popular demands for social justice, the Islamist rallying cry of return to Sharia led to regressive gender policies with devastating consequences for women. Compulsory dress codes, gender segregation, and policing of morality through the revival of cruel punishments and outdated patriarchal and tribal models of social relations. These developments widened the gap between religious and secularist Muslim and intensified the conflict between Islamist, Islamist and feminist. While feeding on older stereotypes, all polit uh, polemics between Islam and the West were reignited. Political Islam portrayed feminism as an extension of colonialist politics 
as a Western plot to undermine the Muslim way of life, hence to be rejected in the name of Islam. Many women's rights activists, on the other hand, attacked regressive policies of political Islam by reviving old Orientalist narratives of Islam as inherently incompatible with modernity and gender equality. By the early 1990s, the conflict between these bitterly opposed ism uh, found a kind of resolution in the emergence of a new gender discourse that came to be called Islamic feminism. I was one of the first scholars to use the term to speak of a new gender consciousness and discourse that had emerged in Iran a decade after the 1979 uh, revolution that brought Islamic uh, political Islam into power. As the term gained currency in the late 1990s, most of those labeled Islamic feminists by academics and journalists rejected either the Islamic or the feminist part of the title. If they came from a religious background and addressed women's rights within an Islamic frame of reference, they wanted to avoid any kind of association with the term feminism and their gender activism was a mixture of conformity and defiance. If they came from a secular background and addressed women's rights from within border feminist and human rights discourses, they rejected being called Islamic, even though many of them located their feminism in Islam. Many of those associated with political Islam took contradictory position and made confusing statements with respect to gender equality. For them, the wider project of gaining power and establishing an Islamic state took priority over equality and democracy. I have argued that what I called um, Islamic feminism, that is feminism that takes its legitimacy from Islam, was the unwanted child of political Islam, but definitely not illegitimate. It did not emerge because political Islam offered an egalitarian vision of gender relations. They did not. Rather. Its agenda, the agenda of political Islam, of return to Sharia, and its attempt to translate into policy the patriarchal gender notions inherent in classical jurisprudence provoked women to increase activ activism and criticism of these notions. And also, it really spurred um, greater activism among secular feminists, who were now um, internationalized and had the legitimacy of international human rights law on their side. The woman that we, the scholar and the press, called Islamic feminists, did not speak with one voice. The position they took were local, diverse, multiple, and evolving, like any kind of uh, feminism. They all sought gender justice and equality for women, but they did not always agree on what constitutes justice or equality or the best ways of attaining them. In the aftermath of 9-11-2001 attacks, the politics and rhetorics of the war on terror added another level of complexity to the troubled relations between Islam and feminism. The illegal invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq both partly justifies as promoting democracy and women's rights. The subsequent revelations of abuses in uh, Iraq and Abu Ghraib and Bagram and the um, double standards employed in promoting United Nations sanctions have all in the eyes of many discredited the, both international human rights and feminist ideals. 
At the same time, for many Muslims, the appeal of Islamism, the appeal of political Islam, has been dented by the human rights abuses committed by uh, Islamists in power, notably the Taliban in Afghanistan, the hardliners in Islamic Republic of Iran, and the rulers of other Muslim states. Yet, wrongly or rightly, many Muslims perceived the war on terror to be directed against them, which not only made them insecure and thus more likely to cling to their tradition, religious traditions, but, and this is really my point here, silenced internal voices of dissent and reform. In the eyes of many, the US invasions were reminiscent of the earlier European civilizing mission, making a hollow mockery of the lofty concepts like democracy, freedom, and women's uh, rights. In 2004, Haifa Zangana, an Iraqi woman novelist who was tortured uh, in Saddam Hussein's prison and now lives in London, wrote in the Guardian newspaper of the new meaning of the word of democracy in Iraq. She says that it had become the boogeyman that the mothers summoned to scare their children into obedience. If they don't go to sleep, they say, quiet, I'll call the dem democracy come. It was against the background, this background, in early February 2007, that a number of us as scholars and activists came together and started to give shape to the idea of founding a global movement for equality and justice. 20th century developments had taught us that there can be no justice for us as Muslim women and no meaningful change until patriarchy is separated from Islam's sacred text. We knew that if we wished to abolish patriarchal laws and customs among Muslims, it was not enough and could not and could be counterproductive to dismiss them as anachronistic or attack them on human rights grounds only. To achieve sustainable and deep-rooted change, we needed dialogue and consensus. We must demonstrate the injustices that arise from patriarchal customs and laws that take their legitimacy from a particular reading of Islam's sacred texts. And instead, we must offer defensive and comprehensible alternatives within a framework that recognizes the spirit of equality and justice in Islam. Only then, we could free ourselves from the apparent choice between the devil of those who wanted to impose the patriarchal interpretations of uh, the Sharia and the deep blue sea of those who pursue a colonialist hegemonic global project in the name of human rights and feminism. To achieve this, we had to do two things. First, we had to build coalitions and consensus among diverse groups of women's rights activists, notably between, uh, on the one hand, those secularists for whom religion and especially Islam had been the enemy, holding back any struggle for equality, and on the other hand, the increasing number of women who are finding sources, uh, sources and justification for their struggle in their faith. Secondly, we had to broaden the debates and horizons of thinking about Muslim family laws and to approach Islam's sacred texts as sources of empowerment rather than as an obstacle uh, for change. It was in the course of these discussions that we realized that the source of many misunderstandings and obstacles to consensus and progress lay in the very notion of Sharia, which both contemporary Islamists and women's rights advocates have constructed as immutable and not open to negotiations or to contestation from within. To encounter this and to pierce the veil of sanctity surrounding the classical law, we invoke two crucial distinctions within the Islamic legal tradition, which have been obscured in recent times. 
you know, when we say Islamic law, it means different things. But basically, the, it covers both the Sharia, which in Muslim belief it is sacred, and it is the path and the way revealed in the Quran. Then it is fiqh, which literally means understanding. And it is the science of jurisprudence. It is how the jurist, classical jurists, derived laws from Islam's sacred text. That is from the Quran and the Hadith, the tradition of the Prophet. But all these jurists were man. So, and the law is actually man-made. And then in modern context, we have Hukuk or Qanun, which is actually the law that has been applied by the state. And all this comes under Islamic law and Sharia, and everything is collapsed in one. Then we have another category within the fiqh, between uh, ibadat, which are the laws that regulate the relationship between believer and God. And the second is the Law, set of laws which come under ma'amilat, which literally means contracts. And that re regulates the relationship among human beings. And marriage, divorce, all come under ma'amilat. Or anything which has to do with the social aspect comes under ma'amilat. So we argue that what is defined as Muslim family law is neither divine or immutable. immutable. It is derived from divine sources, but in the end, it is a human understanding and a legal construct. All these laws that we have, they are the product of fiqh as developed by the classical juries in a vastly different historical and social and economic context. They all be be uh, belong to the realm of mu'amilat that are open to interpretation in line with the demands of time and place. These rulings we contended must change because they no longer reflect the justice that is uh, the spirit of uh, the Sharia. The classical jurist conceptions of justice and gender relations, we argued, were shaped in interaction with the social, economic, and political realities of the world in which they lived. The, concept, uh, of, uh, the concepts of gender equality and human rights, as we understand them today, had no place in their time and little relevance to their conceptions of justice. But in our time and our context, there can be no justice without gender equality. CEDO, which wants to eliminate gender discrimination, is more in line with the Sharia than is current family laws in many Muslim contexts. Drawing on the new wave of reformist thought and scholarship in Islam, we grounded our claim for, to equality and our arguments for the reform of family laws simultaneously in Islamic and human rights framework. Following and building on the work of earlier reformers, this new scholarship no longer seeks as the previous one did, an Islamic genealogy for modern concepts like gender equality, human rights, and democracy. Rather, it places the emphasis on how religion is understood and how religious knowledge is produced, how gender is constructed in Islamic legal tradition, and how interpretations of the Sharia must be evaluated in their historical context. We commissioned a number of uh, papers by reformist thinkers such as Amina Badud, Khaled Abu Fadal, and Muhammad Khaled Masood. We use them as a way of opening new horizons for thinking to lift the veil of sanctity from fiqh, from jurisprudence, by showing the genesis of current Muslim family laws, how they were constructed within the Muslim legal tradition. We sought to show how the wealth of resources within the tradition and the Quranic verses on justice, compassion, and equality can support the promotion of human rights and a process of reform toward more egalitarian family relations. These papers were published as, as, um, as a book. Um, these are, yes. These papers were published in, in form of a book called Wanted, 
equality and justice in the Muslim family, available in Arabic, English, and French. And we became the basis for a wider discussion with a larger group of scholars and activists. The discussion then shaped the Musaba framework of action. Briefly and generally, the papers in Wanted trace the genesis of gender inequality inherent in Islamic legal tradition to a contradiction between the ideals of the Sharia and the patriarchal structures within which these ideals unfolded and were translated into legal norms. Islam's call for freedom, justice, and equality was submerged in the norms and practices of Arab society and culture of the seventh century and the formative years of Islamic law. Patriarchal norms were assimilated into fiqh, jurisprudential rulings, through a set of theological, legal, and social theories and assumptions that reflected the state of knowledge of the time and were part of the fabric of the society. This was done by sanctification of existing marriage practices and gender ideologies and the exclusion of women from the production, production of religious knowledge. And in fact, what the feminist scholarship in Islam shows that the more that we move from the era of the prophet, the more women are marginalized and they are silenced. Women are among the main transmitters of hadith, which is the second source of law. But by the time that fiqh schools, that is the jurisprudential schools, emerge, there is no trace of them. They are silenced. And we basically show that how these feminist voices, how women's concerns and women's voices were silenced uh, in uh, the early uh, time. And if you are interested, I really recommend to have a look at the book Wanted, and it is available online as well. In Mosawa, we aim to bring scholarship and, uh, and active, uh, scholars and activists together to bridge two gaps in the Muslim um, family laws and debates and in Muslim legal tradition. First, a majority of Muslim religious scholars today remain gender blind, unaware of the importance of gender as a category of thought and ignorant or scornful of feminist theories. Secondly, in line with the mainstream feminism, many women's rights activists and campaigners in Muslim context have long considered engaging with religious ideas to be counterproductive, in fact, as a waste of time, as they put it. Choosing to work only within a human rights framework, they have avoided any religious-based arguments. These activists tend to be impatient of the masses, perhaps a large majority, of women in the Muslim world, in all classes and uh, age groups, who are as just as pious Muslims as their forebears. They also tend to ignore the epistemological side to feminism, which examines how we know what we know about women in all branches of knowledge, including in religious uh, tradition. This knowledge not only sheds light on laws and practices that take the legitimacy from religion, but enables a challenge from within to the patriarchy that is institutionalized in Muslim legal tradition like other religious traditions. But the divide between Islam and feminism has not been easy to overcome. It led to heated exchanges among the members of the planning committee and to continual redrafting of the framework. And it was loudly voiced in the Musawa launch gathering in February 2009. While women's rights activists from Indonesia and Malaysia have no qualms about working with religion, many activists from other regions, in particular from North Africa, 
showed a um, deep down mistrust of religion, which they saw as inherently patriarchal, and thus any engagement with it as a futile and an incorrect strategy. They argued that feminist demands, and by extension human rights and equality, were only achievable by a secular approach. Other participants, however, found such an engagement with religion empowering and liberating and welcomed it enthusiastically. One uh, young woman exclaimed, I feel like someone opened the window into my mind and let the fresh air in. It feels good. This is what uh, Mona um, El Tahavi observed. She was among the participants. She continued, Mona continues to say, how lucky that young movement is, I thought. Just over 20 years ago, I felt as though I had to smash the window into my mind, open myself. Fists ble bleeding, bruised, to catch some of that fresh air. I have a video of uh, Musawa, uh, a video that we uh, produced for the opening ceremony, but I won't show it now because I might not have uh, time. But if I have time at the end, I will show it. And I just want to tell you a little bit more about what we have been doing in Musawa since its launch and where we are going and give my concluding remarks as well. Musawa is now three years old. It's speaking, but it's not walking yet. We are planning our next global meeting in Cairo in late 2014, when the small secretariat now hosted by Sisters in Islam in Malaysia will move to an Arab country, hopefully Egypt. In 2010, as part of its international advocacy area of work, um, as part of its international advocacy area of work, uh, Musawa began a critical engagement with CEDO Committee and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. So far, we have submitted statements, general recommendations on economic um, on economic consequences of marriage and dissolution, and a number of thematic reports on Article 16 of CEDO. And we have held workshops in Islam and women's rights. We also conducted a research project on CEDO and Muslim family laws, in which we reviewed the documents uh, for 44 countries Sorry, I don't have it here. Yeah. Uh, we, we reviewed the um, documents uh, from 44 countries with Muslim uh, majority or a significant Muslim minority that reported to the CEDO committee between 2005 and 2010. We focus on the language of the justifications that the state parties gave for not implementing CEDO with regard to family law and practices that discriminate against women. We provided responses to this justification uh, which basically amounted, you know, the justification that they had was that they just cannot go against the Sharia. Not making the distinction between Sharia and Fair and CEDO community neither had the legitimacy or the knowledge uh, to answer this um, argument. So we use the Musawa language based on the holistic approach that we advocated in Musawa's framework for the deeper engagement and a more meaningful dialogue between Muslim family laws and practices and international human rights law. In 2010, as part of uh, our knowledge building area of work, we initiated a long-term and multifaceted project on rethinking the notion of authority in Muslim family laws. This project has two interconnected elements. The first is the production of new feminist knowledge that critically engages with uh, the concepts that continue to legitimize, legitimize and institutionalize a patriarchal model of family and gender relations. We focus on how the legal concepts of Qawama and Velaya, I later explain what they are 
which placed women under male uh, guardianship were constructed in classical jurisprudence and become embodied in contemporary laws and practices in Muslim contexts. Qawama denotes a husband's authority and responsibility to provide for the wife, and velaya denotes the guardianship rights of a father or in his absence, another male member of the family over his children, including his daughters uh, before marriage. So basically, these are the two key, key concepts. And the entire Muslim family law revolves around these two concepts. And you know, once you take them and give them an egalitarian interpretation and understanding, patriarchy collapses. The second element of the project studies how these two concepts are experienced, understood, and contested in real life by documenting the life stories of Muslim women and men in different countries and the use of quantitative and qualitative data to show the disconnect between the law and socioeconomic realities in Muslim families today. We aim to show how the notion of male authority over women is a juristic construct with no Quranic uh, justification, and that egalitarian interpretations are both possible and more in tune with contemporary lived, uh, Muslims' lived uh, realities. In my view, it is this combination of insertion of women's concerns and voices into the production of religious knowledge and legal reforms and the engagement with the international human rights and feminism that distinguishes Musawa from other prominent transnational networks and groups advocating Muslim women's rights. I have in mind uh, Women Living Under Muslim Laws, which started in 1984, and Karama, uh, Muslim Women's Lawyers for America, which is based in New uh, here in US, started again in 1984, and WISE, Women's Initiative for Equality and Justice, which started in 2006. Let me now bring different elements of my argument together. Uh, together and make explicit some of what has remained implicit. First, one of the key issues that Muslim women have confronted in their struggle for equality is the linkage between the religious and political dimensions of identity in Muslim context. This linkage is not new. It has its roots in the colonial era, but it took on a new distinct expression in the 1970s with the emergence of Islam as a political and a spiritual force. With the end of the colonial era, the rise of secular and despotic regimes in Muslim countries, and their suppression of progressive forces left a vacuum that was filled by Islamic movements. Strengthened dramatically by the success of the Iranian Revolution in 1979, Islamic movements gained momentum with the subsequent perceived defeat of communism. But it was not until the US response to the events of 9-11, in particular the invasions of Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003, that Muslim women found themselves in the crossfire. Both invasions, as I said, were partially justified in the name of saving Muslim women. US neoconservatives and rightist parties in Europe noisily promoted women of Muslim backgrounds, such as Ayan Hirshi Ali, who have openly voiced criticism of what they understood as Islam, though their versions is in fact as dogmatic and patriarchal as that of the Islamists, Islamists they oppose. Pause. The second strand of my argument is that the clash between political Islam and feminism gave birth to a new discourse that is Islamic in its language and source of legitimacy, yet feminist in its demands. By both uncovering a hidden history and rereading textual sources, its advocates are showing that the, in, in, that the inequalities embedded in the legal 
tradition of Islam or faith or jurisprudence are neither manifestations of a divine will nor cornerstones of an irredeemably backward social system. Rather, they are human construction and open to negotiation. Freed from taking uh, apologetic and defensive position, Muslim women could go beyond old, old jurisprudential dogmas, go back to Islam's sacred texts, and ask new and daring questions. Finally, I believe that a new phase has opened in the politics of Islam and feminism, where an honest and constructive dialogue is possible. There is no magical instant cure for the painful wounds of the past and present. But there is always a way to begin to address them. We must learn the art of addressing the past without being its victim. For me, this is where the new feminist voices in Islam have something to offer. They are rewriting the conventional narrative of Islam as it has been shaped by despotic politics and orientalist scholarship. This rewriting, I stress, is a necessary initial step for changing the terms of the debate about Muslim women and their struggle for justice and equality. A meaningful and constructive dialogue, however, can only take place when the two parties can treat each other as equals, when they are ready to listen to each other's arguments and to change positions if necessary. Feminist voices and scholarship in Islam have something to offer here. They can enable Western feminists to look again at it. The Western feminism to look again at its own troubled relationship with religion and to re-examine its dogmas. Now that religion is back in the public space and the thesis that modernization must bring privatization of religion has been seriously questioned. We all need to ask, what does it mean to be secular and religious or feminist in today's context? Isn't the theological political as with the feminist understanding that the personal is political? I believe and hope that we are at the threshold of a new phase in the politics of religion, state and gender, both globally and locally. The year 2009 may prove to be as important a turning point as 1979. The launch of Musawa was not alone in making a new phase in the struggle against Islamic uh, political Islam's attempt to restore gender inequality. The emergence of the Green Movement in Iran in June 2009 in the aftermath of the disputed presidential election was another such marker. We can no longer view events through the prism of dichotomies such as secular versus religious, feminism versus Islam. The 2011 events in the Arab world have demonstrated that the struggle is between despotism and democracy on the one hand and patriarchy and feminism on the other. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have a question about how you ended, about uh, a word that you mentioned only toward the end, secularism. And I do study Bangladesh. Like just very <laughs> Secularism. Yes. So, um, it seems to me that one of the tensions I find when, I'm, when I talk about religion to feminists in Bangladesh, which is a very different Muslim context from Iran or anywhere else, where there isn't the rise of political Islam either, particularly. So there isn't that threat. But secular feminists do think of Islam as this, there's a real fear not of religion, but of Islam, and it's a much longer standing fear than 9-11. And what 9-11 has done is something very interesting, because there, everybody understands that the US has misused this whole rhetoric of saving Muslim women, and you know, there, so there is this imperialist agenda. At the same time, as you also pointed out, these women are using, older, have re, re 
invoked these older orientalist scripts about how dangerous Islam is for women. These are the women for whom, what they, what they would say to something like Musawa is that, well, you're only at best talking about Muslims and secularism in this very narrow sense, which is like banishing religion to the private sphere. Um, secularism is the only thing that will ultimately protect Muslims and non-Muslims. Um, so I'm wondering about how Musawa would, first of all, manage that tension between feminism, feminists, Muslim feminists. These, are, these might be feminists who are actually Muslim feminists who are even practicing Islam, but who totally reject the idea of secularism, sort of, you know, the, who, are, yes. who really fear Islam. Mm. That, and also the question of minorities, and I wonder if you ever talk about that. Yes, we do. Can I take this question? Because this is a very important question. And it is, you know, as I mentioned, that the challenge between um, Islam and feminism, uh, feminist and uh, secular feminist, uh, and how to bring them into Mosavo is has been really problematic. Because first we thought that we can do it. But we are in the process of realizing that no, probably it's not possible. Bangladesh and Pakistan and that part of the world is actually has a very difficult relationship with religion. So there uh, uh, we found it very difficult to have anybody involved in Mosawa from Bangladesh because you know no way they want to deal with it. Uh, but I think um, feminism in Muslim context, whether it is political Islam, which is uh, from above, or from the traditional Islam, from patriarchy, which is their part of the culture, uh, feminists who are not willing to deal with it gradually will become irrelevant to the context that they are, if they want. And, and there are certain assumptions that we must unpack. One of them is the idea of secularism is a neutral space. Everybody can have a space there, and it is a democratic space. No, it is not. Especially in Muslim context, secularism, like religion, is not democratic. So the problem is not, in fact, between secularism and religion. The, the problem I see it between democracy and uh, uh, despotism. And uh, with all due respect, because I have been working with women's rights group and movements, many of these women's rights activists themselves are despots. You look at their organization, the place that they give to wrong young people, and the way that they really want to uh, speak for women, for certain groups. So I think we need to go through a process of democratization of women's movement. And one part of that democratization is to create a space where women or religious feminism or Islamic feminism can have a faith, voice. Because now if you are in a Pakistani or or uh, in Bangladesh context, and want to work with an NGO, there is no way that you can really bring your religious uh, world. So it's a process, it's a process of engagement, and we are hoping that we can start a conversation with them in, um, uh, the, uh, in the course of Musawa. And in fact, it is interesting that um, both in Pakistan and Bangladesh, they, because one of the things that we do in Musawa is provide training courses from the rights, uh, Islam from the rights perspective. And these are the courses for women who are activists, who are feminists, familiar with human rights concept. But the moment that you put a Quranic verse in front of them, they are silenced. So it is actually to enable them to understand religious, to understand the construction of gender in religion, and not just to be frightened. And my final point is that, you know, that fear, most of the time if we fear something, it comes from our ignorance. If, because we make the other so different and do not want to learn about the other, and the other can be a religious woman or a Muslim woman or whatever, it is, it is that fear. So I hope with knowledge that fear gradually can conquer. And for minorities, it is actually we engage very well with minorities, both in Canada and others and in uh, India as well.
there is less hostility and, in fact, a lot of reception. Um, so my question is um, around um, where you postulate it. You know, in order to have dialogue, you need to have, you know, two people willing to come to the table and engage, obviously, in an e equitable discussion. And in that way, we can start achieving some progress. It seems to be a very wonderful theory. Um, I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more about how can you, in a world where you know both men and women, um, illiteracy in the Muslim countries are, is an all-time high, um, ignorance is an all-time high, as you were mentioning, and of course, you know, education, as you were saying, and knowledge is going to ultimately be power. How, how will you be able to create that kind of dialogue with all of these potential hindrances or, or hurdles, um, uh, you know, over time? And I guess I just wanted to hear a little bit more about what kind of thoughts you had, um, whether it be Musawa's or your own personal thoughts on that. Yes, it, it's not easy, but then we have no other choice. You know, it, um, I think in uh, uh, feminist scholars in Islam have managed to create that dialogue with ulama, with the reformist thinking. And so there is a kind of dialogue which is going on there. And one part of that, uh, what enables them is their knowledge their knowledge of the sacred sources, their understanding of the process of jurisprudence, and, and, and Muslim legal tradition is also a scholarly tradition, which has been trying and struggling with the notion of equality and human rights. So within the Muslim legal tradition, there are forces who really want that dialogue. For instance, in 1990s, I was uh, traveling, I was researching in Iran, and many of the clerics wanted to talk to me because they basically wanted to understand the essence of feminist critique in order to provide an answer. And I also wanted to understand the jurisprudence. Okay, sometimes, you know, we talk across each other, but at the end, after 10 years, there is a meaningful dialogue. So it takes time, and, and I think for dialogue, it is really, uh, we, if we as feminists engage a di in a dialogue with um, uh, Muslim legal tradition, with the clerics or with those who do not think uh, like us, we need, to, uh, we need to prepare ourselves uh, to go into dialogue with the idea that our position might change. And that gives uh, the other side. But then I basically um, believe that there is no way that you can have a meaningful dialogue unless you, know, you are treated as an equal and with respect. And, uh, and to be treated as an equal is something that you got to work for it. And I think Muslim women and Muslims can do that. And here we find an ally in feminist and with feminism, because many feminists and many Western feminism is actually are able, we are able to engage in that dialogue. Provided, you know, if we come from a Muslim context, we do not come from a very defensive position and are prepared to suspend our judgment and enter that dialogue. What have been, we've been doing in Mosava is, mm, we define Mosava as a knowledge building movement. Because for us, knowledge is source of authority. It is the knowledge that gives us the courage to oppose patriarchal interpretations. And also it is the knowledge of feminism and what is happening there, which enables us to uh, enter a dialogue with the Western feminism. So basically we see it as a knowledge and how to transmit this knowledge to the activists on the ground and provide them with the language to work with. But it is a process and it is not easy. And sometimes, you know, we might accept that, you know, with some people there is no way to have a dialogue, but that is all right. And then that admittance is also important. But that doesn't mean their rejection, but you don't waste your time any longer. Thank you very much. I found that very interesting. And I was very um, interested also in the nuance that you brought to um, 
the first woman's question about uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. I am um, interested in the West African context, and I do. I have a long connection to Mali, yes. and so um, I'm wondering if you could do, if you have any knowledge and information about um, that context as well. Uh, yes, uh, we have actually in our planning committee, and now planning committee is, was changed to advisory, international advisory group. We have one of the prominent uh, activists there, Dingri, which works uh, with a group of women. I can't remember the name of her organization. So through her, we have learned a lot about Mali. But Mali is now going through a total transition, and which is partially to do with what happened in Libya. And, and this, is, this is violent, but the, interestingly, that women's group are now fighting back. Well, there's the whole issue over the, the family law that was part of what's being addressed in the current upheaval. Um, so I'm just interested in any kind of, yes, there's a, Yes, there's the current crisis, but there's the underlying social context, yes. um, which, which maybe on the other side of this can be addressed in a different way. So I'm interested in what you might have to say about the um, underlying social context in the same way you talked about it in Pakistan and mm. Bangladesh. Yeah, I, I'm not that much informed about Mali about that, but uh, the only thing that I know is that they did not succeed about this family law. Right. But uh, the way that uh, right. we see it, it is not the end. Right. It's a process, but this process has been so, uh, at the moment, a bit halted by the violence there. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I'm, I'm not very well thank you very familiar much. with that context. I was just wondering, um, do you think that one who is not a Muslim, I mean, I would consider myself a feminist, but I'm not Muslim, would you, would you say that there's a place at the table for advocates or supporters who want to do that? Could you elaborate on that more? Because it seems like to be an advocate for, at least in my position, I would say um, coming as like a Westerner, it would, I feel like I'd be stepping on territory that, you know, imposing my views. So how would a non-Muslim who is a supporter really go about showing support? Yes, I think definitely there is room and we are working with people, some of our scholars are not Muslim and some of those who are involved in uh, Mosavo are very secular Muslims. So, you know, it's not important. But we are at this moment, at this juncture, we are very clear that we want Mosava to be led by Muslim women. But that doesn't mean that others cannot be part of it. Others cannot uh, enrich it. But the leadership, and that is basically for the political reasons, because we really think that uh, Muslim women should claim the voice both vis-a-vis -vis the wider global agenda and uh, within that. But if you are interested, please look at our website. We have a quote tree. And if you give you, uh, me your name, you know, we would be delighted that uh, you know, at least you know, read our material and talk about it and uh, in other capacity. So there is room for, uh, for that as well. well and I think that's an excellent note on which to end, which is to encourage everyone to read more about it. Um, and I encourage you to come back to the BCRW um, on the 9th for Digital Feminism and on November 14th when we bring Digital Feminism and Islam together. Um, and now I very much encourage you to join me in thanking Dr. Mir Husseini for a great lecture. <laughs>